Have you ever caught yourself staring in a mirror maybe a little bit too long and you start to get this weird kind of uncanny feeling that you're being watched? Maybe while staring at yourself and thinking, why do people let me leave the house when I look like this? you've caught the slightest glimpse of unease in your own face. Probably not, because that would be super goofy, but in the world of Dungeons & Dragons, it is a whole different situation. See, today's creature is an elemental trickster, a being that lives on the plane of mirrors and very well could be staring back into your character's eyes every time they look into one. Welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of D&D or other tabletop games and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition D&D game. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, Today we are of course talking about the Mirror Method, a brand new method that you can add to your repertoire of methods which already exist in the 5th edition monster manual and use them to play pranks on your players or cause them to go insane because of how difficult to track down these little critters are. But we will get into all of that. The first thing you need to know about this creature is that it comes to us from a little module known as Expedition into the Demon Web Pits which is exactly as much fun as it sounds like. There's demons, there's webs, there's pits, really just a great time all around. In this module, mirror methods are used to great effect as a potential encounter ally for more difficult enemies, often as the summoned creature that is owned or controlled by some kind of spellcaster. These guys are extremely difficult to take down with magical means, and even if you're using mundane methods, it's still very hard unless you know exactly what you're supposed to do. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna go over what these guys can do in combat, their strengths, their weaknesses, and then of course some plot hooks and ways that you can actually use them in your game as NPCs, enemies, allies, and kind of everything in between. But first things first, in order to understand just exactly how we can use these creatures, we do need to understand their abilities and how they fight, so let's talk about some. So as a shiny, reflective, elemental creature from the plane of mirrors, it should come as no surprise that these creatures can reflect spells. The only other creature to my knowledge in Dungeons & Dragons, at least in 5th edition especially, that can do this is the Tarrasque. So this is a pretty interesting ability. What that means is anytime the method is targeted by a magic missile spell, a line spell such as lightning bolt, or a single target attack spell, it reflects it back at the person who cast it as if it was originating from the method. This is really interesting because there's no limit on the level of the spell that can be reflected back, so it's really only as powerful as whatever magic is thrown at it, which I think is really cool. Because the method is a CR2 creature, but it makes it so they're not irrelevant. If you catch someone off guard with this, someone at level 16 could be using a 5th or 6th level spell and that's going to be cast back at them the same way as a level 1 wizard casting magic missile would have that magic missile reflected back at them. So obviously the damage you take is going to be proportionate to whatever you could deal, which is very interesting. And even spells that can't be reflected back, such as big area of effect spells like fireball or even charms and that kind of thing that don't necessarily deal damage, are still going to have a hard time getting through because the method is just resistant to magic, so it will have advantage on any saves it makes against magical effects. This is mostly because of its mirror-like nature, but all methods have some kind of inherent magic within them as well, so this is just an enhanced version of that, I guess. And on the topic of magic, like most other methods, this creature can, of course, cast a couple of spells. And the two spells it can cast are, of course, very on theme for this creature. The first one, of course, being Mirror Image. For those of you not familiar with what this spell does, it essentially allows you to make a couple copies of yourself that are illusory and sort of float on top of you, making it very difficult to hit you. So if someone tries to hit you while you have the spell active, there's a chance that they might hit one of the duplicates, which if they do, that duplicate is destroyed, but you completely ignore any damage that would be dealt by that hit. So this is a very strong defensive tool. So between that and its magic resistance and its spell reflection, it's very difficult to take down. The other spell it has is Simulacrum, which again is one of those spells that is as good as the person is using the spell on. This spell essentially makes a copy of someone that can do pretty much anything that that person can do, However, it does not copy any of their gear or anything like that. It merely has their physical attributes. Meaning that if you're fighting against a level 1 Barbarian and it makes a copy of your party Barbarian and that simulacrum to Barbarian picks up a stick, it's a pretty big deal. 
But it could do the same thing to a level 16 Barbarian, and then you're going to obviously have a much more potent Simulacrum that is now going to be allied with this method. And this is a pretty high level spell to give to such a low CR'd creature, so I think the fact that it only becomes more powerful the more power is thrown at it is really interesting. Plus, Simulacrum can have a thousand uses outside of combat too, which makes it very useful as a tool in its kit. Now, in terms of actual physical abilities, it can do two things. One of the things it can do is Claw, which is pretty simple it's a melee attack doesn't do a ton of damage but hey it's a claw attack the second thing it can do is use its breath weapon which again most methods have and this creature blows a cone of glass shards it's pretty standard the creatures in the area have to make a dexterity save and if they fail they take some slashing damage nothing too outside of the box and of course like every other method it does also have a death burst ability meaning that when it dies eventually it will explode into a burst of glass shards that will cut to pieces anyone within 10 feet of it so knowing what we know about methods and all of the resistances that this thing has you're probably thinking this sounds pretty difficult to take down especially for a CR2 creature, so what exactly can your players do to destroy it? And the answer to that, of course, is that this creature is vulnerable to bludgeoning damage and thunder damage. After all, it is an elemental made out of glass. So extremely loud noises that cause thunder damage, such as a thunderous smite or a thunder wave spell, are going to absolutely devastate this creature, and the same thing goes for large blunt instruments that are going to cause big surface area damage like a barbarian's maul. Those two vulnerabilities are the key to destroying this creature. Well, let's talk about that and get into some. So as I always say, creatures like this that are very difficult to take down and have very specific strengths and specific weaknesses you often want to give your players a chance to at least find out about those strengths and weaknesses before they encounter this monster. I mean, sure, you could just use it as a random encounter, but outside of a place like the Plane of Mirrors, that's a very weird thing to just run into. Especially as per their own lore, mirror methods are quite rare. So having them know it's possible they might encounter one of these creatures and then give them at least the opportunity to look into it if they so choose means that when they actually get into battle, the method's not going to have a crazy advantage. And also, if they don't do any of that research, it's not on you as the DM for kind of springing a trap on them that they have no chance to win. It's on them for not doing their proper research before going into a fight. So the way this thing is used in the book it comes from primarily is as a familiar to a powerful wizard, which can be a great use of this creature. If you have an NPC in your game, whether they're an enemy or an ally or somewhere in between, a mirror method can function as a very uncommon familiar, which will add something memorable to the encounter. It gives you kind of like a little sidekick NPC that you can role play. Maybe they're pesky, maybe they're very knowledgeable and friendly, whatever personality you choose to give them. It'll definitely be something that will make the players think back on that encounter and say oh that was kind of neat or what was the deal with that guy's weird companion and maybe prompt them to look into it something really interesting about these creatures too is that as an elemental which all methods in fifth edition are they of course have to be comprised of one or two different elemental types mirror methods are of earth elemental and fire elemental heritage because if minecraft has taught me anything it's that if you put a bunch of sand and a bunch of fire together you get glass and that of course means that these creatures can speak Ignan and Terran, which are the two specific dialects of Primordial. And when they speak those languages, or any language that your Mephit knows how to speak, it does so in a very peculiar way. Mephits are often meant to be the embodiment of their own nature, so mirror Mephits love repetition. They'll often answer a question with a question until they finally circle back around and get to the original question again, and only then will they really give you a straight answer. And even then, it's probably going to be in some kind of odd sort of phrasing that involves lots of repeating themselves. I think stuff like that is great when you have these little tidbits of the way monsters behave and their ecology. And the entry for these guys in the book that they come from is pretty extensive. It talks about how where they come from, the plane of mirrors, is this sort of repetitious and mundane place. It's not a very big plane and the methods who live there find it quite boring. So they love going to the material plane because it means they can go on lots of adventures and experience things that they wouldn't normally see on their home plane. So you're probably wondering, how does one of these creatures get to the material plane from the plane of mirrors? And there's a few different ways. They can of course be summoned as a familiar or an indentured servant or whatever wizards are calling it nowadays when they summon a creature from their home plane. And of course there are some very rare portals in the plane of mirrors that can bring them into the material plane as well. But the one thing that's constant 
is whenever a mirror method goes from the plane of mirrors into the material plane, the doorway that they pass through is always some type of magically enchanted mirror that exists in the real world. See, every mirrored surface in their home world is kind of meant to be the other side of another mirrored surface that exists in the material plane. And being magical creatures that are kind of made of the stuff of the plane they live on, they can see through those surfaces and see what's on the other side of that mirror, which is very interesting. The lore entry for these creatures goes as far as to talk about what they do with certain mirrored surfaces. For example, those among them who are more ambitious and want to learn magic will often try to find mirrored surfaces that allow them to look in on wizards or clerics or other arcane using beings. Or a mirror in such a place that often shows scenes of battle or great heroics on the other side of it, such as a mirror that might be carried around with an adventuring party, will often be given to young mirror methods simply as a source of entertainment. It's literally like watching live television. And this is all very interesting because there's... And this is kind of where the idea comes from that when you're looking in the mirror and your eyes don't really look like your own eyes, it's because there's a method on the other side kind of watching you through that mirror, which I think is very interesting because there's a lot to unpack there and there's a lot you can do with that idea. Say perhaps instead of going into the material plane, you have a method or a group of methods that pulls someone through a mirror into their world. It could be because they want something from that person. Maybe they want them to teach the methods magic. Maybe one of their ancestors slighted them at some point. Now they're exacting their revenge. Or maybe they're simply just being cruel and tricky as is their nature. But whatever the case is, if you set up that kidnapped person as an important NPC or maybe the child of an important NPC or someone that is relevant to the party, they may have to go on an adventure through that same mirror into the plane of mirrors and look to rescue this person who was taken, which could be a really fascinating side adventure. And it's not often you get to have an excuse to pull a low level party into another plane for a quick little one shot esque adventure in the middle of your campaign. So that could be really interesting. Or if you're running a game for higher level players, you could also allow the wizard to maybe summon one of these creatures as a familiar. Or even if they're not a wizard or someone who has the fine familiar spell, perhaps the party finds like a small mirror that's enchanted and one of these creatures is trapped within it. And by breaking that mirror, they set it free and then that creature will either run away or possibly help the party if they can convince it to stay or it might just be a very small and most likely brief encounter. In terms of actually setting these guys up as minions too, you can do a lot of janky kind of stuff with their reflection ability. For example, if you have two mirror methods set up across a room from each other, and then you have a spellcaster go into the middle of the room and they cast lightning bolt. And the second they cast it, they have an action ready to just jump out of the way. I probably wouldn't let them get away with it scot-free without taking some damage unless they quickened the spell, but you get the idea. What's gonna happen is that lightning bolt is going to bounce off of that mirror method back at them. But if you have another mirror method standing behind them, then it will bounce off of that mirror method and back at the original one, which essentially allows you to build a wall of lightning that is constantly bouncing back and forth at literally light speed that is going to be a very difficult obstacle for people to get through. So if your party shows up on the doorstep of a dungeon and there's just a wall of lightning, they now have to figure out how to get past it. And there's many different ways they could do that, some of which could include just running through it. And if they're a low level party, that's going to hurt a lot. But as long as those methods stay within range of the spell and on a flat surface in front of each other, that spell is going to constantly be bouncing back and forth between them, which can really add a cool dynamic to an encounter. Because even if you're not using it as an obstacle and this happens in the middle of battle, that can be incredible. You can have methods kind of circling around the outside with walls of lightning setting up and the party's going to have to very strategically choose where they want to stand if they're going to avoid getting hit by that lightning. But this is also an obstacle for the enemy as well. Granted, the bad guy in this situation would have control over the methods, so it's controlled chaos, but it still kind of closes off different routes which they can move on the map, which can be really interesting too. And if you want to do that with a lower level party and you're worried that a straight up lightning bolt might kill one of them, you could always do it with some other kind of lower level version of the same spell that does a little less damage maybe. But regardless of how you do this, it does create a problem and makes it so that the boss's minions can't be ignored unless you're okay with this crazy spell bouncing all over the place. 
But however you do decide to employ these creatures, they are really awesome. And methods are just kind of cool in general, so it's always nice to have another one in that repertoire of little elemental creatures. Especially one that has such unique abilities and can be used in so many different ways as friend or foe. So if you do like this creature and you want to use it in your games, the stat block is in the description below, just in the form of a Google document there. And if you are one of my patrons, of course, you can get the monster manual style Photoshop stat block that I make every week on the Patreon page there. Also, this is probably going to be the last video of 2019. So I just want to say thank you guys so much for joining me for another year, whether you were here in the end of whether you joined at the end of 2018 or you found my channel this year, whatever the case is, thank you so much for watching and for sticking around and being so supportive. You guys are honestly awesome and having such a cool community is seriously the only thing that keeps me doing this because it's just so much fun to release content when I know who's going to be watching it. So thank you for that. I'm really looking forward to 2020. It's going to be an awesome year. I've got some pretty big stuff in the works that I'm really excited to show you all. So I guess that's it for this video and that's it for 2019. So until 2020, I'll see you then.